Okay, welcome Sats fans. I'm Andy Edstra, Managing Director of Swan Advisor Services, and I'll be your host for this special edition of Swan Signal Live. It's our special boating accident edition. It seems our usual host, Brady Swenson, decided to sail off into the Miami sunset, and we haven't seen him since. But don't worry, he'll be back next week, uh, and I'm sure he'll tell us how many sats he lost uh, beneath the waves of Miami Beach. Um, speaking of Miami, I want to personally thank all of you who made it out to the Bitcoin 2022 conference. All the swans who were there had a great time meeting you, uh, who are all of you who were able to make it. And we really appreciate you making the trip. And for those of you who didn't make it, there's always next year. I didn't make it the prior year, uh, but this was a great time. And, uh, all the swans had a great time meeting all of you. So, Swan, as you know, is uh, one of the easiest and cheapest places to buy Bitcoin. We pair easy purchases with education, top-notch education and customer service. We try to make it easy enough for your grandma or grandpa can buy Bitcoin with us. So send us your family members and we'll take good care of them. Uh, speaking of family members, I know many of you, or at least some of you, have financial advisors or maybe family members who have financial advisors. My mission at Swan is to get Bitcoin into the hands of those clients, of those financial advisors. I'm not talking about uh, proxy Bitcoin. I'm not talking about paper wrap Bitcoin. I'm talking about actual Bitcoin. So it's Swan Advisor Services. We're providing financial advisors with the tools to put actual Bitcoin into the hands of clients. So if you're a financial advisor or you got friends or family with a financial advisor or you know one, send them to swan.com forward slash advisor or reach out direct, send me an email at andy at swanbitcoin.com. All right, now to today's show. Um, I am very honored uh, and lucky to have two OGs with me today. These guys have both been in Bitcoin for well over a decade. They really need no introduction, but I am definitely gonna say a few words. Um, we have Max Kaiser. Max Kaiser is the man who's been telling you to buy Bitcoin since it was around a dollar a coin. This is a special treat for me because I've been a guest on two of Max's shows in the past, so I'm excited to turn the tables on him today. Um, and I can't imagine a better guest to do it with. Um, speaking of those shows, Max is the host of the Orange Pill podcast, along with his lovely and brilliant wife, Stacy, of course, which is one of my absolute favorites. Uh, he's also a general partner at Elzani Capital and Heisenberg Capital, where he invests in Bitcoin companies and infrastructure. And of course, uh, speaking of content as well, Max is the author of The Book of Max, which is a deep dive into Max's mind, as well as Bitcoin. Highly recommend picking it up if you haven't already. Simon Dixon, speaking of books, Simon Dixon is the author of the book Bank to the Future, which was very precedent about the state of the financial system and one of the, one of the earliest uh, Bitcoin books, effectively. He's also the founder of the firm of the same name, via which he has invested in numerous Bitcoin companies uh, very early, and a lot of those companies are challenging the existing banking system. So he's been ahead of what's going on in the world of money, in the world of banking, and uh, the companies he has backed are disrupting those sectors as we speak. Um, yes, gentlemen, thank you both. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Simon, for joining us. Yeah, great to be with you, Andy. <clears throat> yeah, Simon. thanks for having me. Um, and it was, um, I think you were talking about Bitcoin 2022. Uh, Max and I first met at Bitcoin 2011. Can you believe it? Well over a decade in Bitcoin. And um, so speaking of Bitcoin 2022, maybe I'll kick it to Max here. Um, you were in Miami. You spoke. You uh, you put out a video uh, carving up some, uh, some dirty, <laughs> dirty fiat on camera, which I think has gotten more than a million views. You know, you're more plugged in to this space probably than anyone. And you got to witness and channel the energy of the conference firsthand. What are your thoughts on the event? Well, you know, every year, these Bitcoin events, the quality of the tailoring and suits goes up, you know, but the uh -huh. message is pretty much the same. Uh, you know, as Simon and I were at Bitcoin in 2011 in Prague, 
and it was freaks and geeks and you know practically homeless people were there and uh over the years uh you know now we're at bitcoin 2022 and you've got people like kevin o'leary and michael saylor and uh um scarmucci and these folks who are very dapper very finely quaffed very professional and uh part of the mainstream media and so uh, bitcoin has a different sheen a different look at these conferences but the message is largely the same you know the thing about bitcoin is it was all everything was in the genesis block and uh no one has really had anything original to say about it for years now because it's uh it the protocol itself is is the standard around which all other forms of value and money are migrating toward so that's really the only message uh, andy is that you know uh, we used to say software is eating the world you know and and the iphone has 30 different devices or more that you used to carry around and it's all in one iphone uh, this is uh, bitcoin you know it's eating value around the world whether it's cash stocks bonds commodities it's all going to end up in bitcoin and that's the big trend you know that's just been true since day one and it'll be true for the next 10 years amen well simon i think i saw uh, on your youtube channel that uh, you had some thoughts about the conference as well you know what's uh, what's your take what thoughts uh, come to mind out of uh, out of this conference after so many that you've uh, watched over the years yeah, so you know the, the the difference is just the 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 sheer numbers and sheer scale. So um, on my update, I said that um, you know the the inspiring thing for me was seeing how Bitcoin is supporting people um, in suppressed regimes. Um, so there was a panel on Bitcoin for Freedom that's worth checking out um, around um, getting out of North Korea and using a brain wallet as your financial services when you're stuck with no um, no wallet and no financial services. Um, also in war-stricken, you know, regimes um, with uh, Palestine and Israel, um, and also some uh, colonial um, French currencies and African continents that are stuck um, with certain currencies. So for in, on the individual freedom level, it was really inspiring. I also enjoyed um, Jack Maller's um, speech I was watching, you know, from home. Uh, while working and, uh, you know, the fact that you can now spend Bitcoin um, using the Lightning Network at most major stores through an integration with point of sale terminals. And finally, countries, you know, Samsung um, trying to one up last year where um, El Salvador was announced as legal tender um, and bringing out the, the, the latest presidents and uh, finance ministers and various other people um, where countries are looking at um, attracting people to their country using Bitcoin. Yeah, so much exciting, uh, so many exciting developments. Uh, the country angle is something that I do want to return to. I want to talk to or talk about El Salvador. Um, but maybe before I do that, actually, I want to kick it back to you, Simon. Um, one of your goals, I think, back in the day was creating a, a fully reserved Bitcoin based bank, is my understanding. And uh, speaking of governments, my understanding is that uh, that was not met uh, warmly, let's say, by the powers that be in government. Um, would love to hear a little bit about that experience, uh, as well as how you think it folds into what's going on with, um, let's say, Bitcoin related banks, you know, whether it's Kraken, whether it's Avanti, um, other entities that are uh, that are trying to follow, I think, in, in your uh, trailblazing footsteps. Yeah, so I mean, I, I found Bitcoin out of sheer desperation in 2011 because I was um, trying to create a bank um, and uh, my goal was to um, create a full reserve bank. I identified three problems with traditional finance. One is when you deposit your money at a bank, the bank becomes the legal owner. The second is once they become the legal owner, they can spend it and direct the flow of funds. And the third is that they increase the money supply every time they issue a loan and therefore um, the supply of money and digital currency was invented by banks as a debt. Um, and so uh, I tried to uh, create the opposite. I wanted to create a bank before Bitcoin was around where people could own their own money, people could spend their own money and um, they could hold it on trust and money wasn't created every time we issue a loan. They were actually just loaning out real money. Um, it wasn't until uh, Bitcoin was created and we went uh, took uh, went over to the Bitcoin conference 2011 um, that I realized these bunch of geeks and cypherpunks were actually uh, creating it 
And so rather than trying to create a bank, um, we had just been rejected by the UK regulator stating that I needed to step down as CEO and we needed to hire a real CEO that had actually banking experience. I was also told that I need to deposit £60 million um, pounds at the Bank of England um, just to get started and to have the conversation. There was no concept of a challenger bank at the time. Um, and then I was also told that you have to create money. Once you get a banking license, you have to engage in fractional reserve and you have to hold the funds at a traditional bank that is creating the money every time they issue a loan. Um, so it was impossible just to do what seemed like was right. Um, and uh, we, we were just very disappointed. And so we found ourselves at the Bitcoin 2011 conference um, and realized all we needed to do was support the industry. So uh, we pivoted Bank to the Future from trying to create a bank to becoming um, an online investment platform and fund many of the companies. Um, uh, Max, and, Max and myself, and uh, we started investing in some of the companies. Um, and they created all of the infrastructure. And then um, the industry just became bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and now we finally have the ability for you to own your own money, to spend your own money. Um, and we have a fixed supply. So we don't need to worry about what's happening yeah. in the traditional system. All they need to do is carry on doing what they're doing. Uh, we can carry on doing what we're doing. Um, and more and more people are finding that the the... the, the the demand for money, you can own money, you can spend the money that has a fixed supply is increasing for individuals, uh, companies and countries. So it's a very exciting time. Wow. Well, thanks for that background. God, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall uh, in the room with uh, with Simon or Max or both at one of those conferences over a decade ago, seeing the realization that, oh, we're trying to build around this system, but Bitcoin Bitcoin is the thing. Bitcoin sol fixes this, right? Bitcoin solves this. Um, what are your thoughts, Max, about uh, about those days? You were very early covering the foibles, the problems, really the disasters that came out of the banking system uh, in the global financial crisis. Um, how do you think about those days now, over a decade ago, from your uh, your coverage of the space, your realization of the shenanigans that was going on and, and how that folded into Bitcoin at those times. Well, just listening to um, you guys talk and to Simon talking, you know, it reminded me that uh, going back to Prague in 2011, the, the company there that was the first company really formed that was seeking funding and was going to uh, kick off like a venture capital uh, uh, move was uh, BitPay, which had uh, positioned itself was going to be the PayPal of Bitcoin. And they would uh, seek uh, relationships with retailers and they were going to do, uh, you could use Bitcoin at the point of sale. And um, that was the, the focus of, I would say, from a commercial perspective, you know, and then the kind of overall mission of Bitcoin over the years has changed somewhat. It became less about the medium of exchange. People kind of ratcheted it all back and say, wait a minute, let's talk about Bitcoin as store of value and get that story straight first, that it's synthetic, digital, absolutely scarce commodity and it's money and it's perfect money. And let's, let's figure that, let's get that figured out and well-established first. And uh, this led to um, the whole confrontation in 2017, the block size wars and the New York agreement. And you had the showdown between those who were looking for bigger blocks and that there should be more transactions and there's competition with Visa and MasterCard. And that's what Bitcoin's all about. Uh, they failed against the nodes and the nodes are securing the network and the network secures money. <clears throat> so then flash forward to Bitcoin 2022, and Jack Mahler's is talking about being able to go into the store and use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange using the Lightning Network to, to you, uh, with the daily just cut with NCR, National Cash Register. So there's kind of a full circle here, you know, that I've, that I've being in this for 11 years now, I've, I'm, I'm observing how this has all come back. Um, so, uh, you know, Lightning was what solved the problem that wasn't available back in 2011. And, um, <clears throat> but that, that was kind of, that's uh, kind of interesting. Uh, you know, so as far as, uh, the, 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 the feeling back in 2011, 
was very much um, that this was coming out of the cypherpunk movement. And, you know, um, it attracted it attracted both the freedom movement, you know, the uh, privacy movement and the encryption movement and the Phil Zimmerman type cypherpunks that were looking for um, security and privacy. And, and it also attracted, I mean, we have lived in this industry for years now with what we popularly popularly call grifters. You know, this is this industry, like all financial industries, attracts grifters. And I and I saw it at Bitcoin 2022. I mean, a lot of you have a lot of people showing up saying, I love Bitcoin, you know, and then when you get talking to them, they're pushing a shit coin. Right. So that I would say at least 20, 25 percent of people there were fake Bitcoiners, which is fine, you know, because um you know, that's just the way things are. But um, that that's something that we've always had as well. We've always had this this uh, this element of um, scams because all all financial markets attract scams. And um, this whole but, but I think that uh, to wrap it up here, I think that what 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 I, I call the Michael Saylor era, which started about two years ago, was really a step up. You know, it was really it was really the beginning of Bitcoin as a serious professional industry, I would say. And so that was, so for eight years though, it was, you had a lot of shit going on. Michael Saylor kind of kicked off a, a new era. I call it the Michael Saylor era that we're in now. And um, I think the next, the next step is going to be, it might, might be the Janet Yellen era because Janet Yellen just came out with a statement that was very, you know, constructive about Bitcoin and talking about it in, in a way that shows that she actually kind of understands it. So now this might be the new the new era where we're the sovereign on the sovereign level where banks start to really accumulate Bitcoin and start mining Bitcoin as a strategic reserve. So that could be the story of the next 12 months. Yeah. Wow. That's a great history there. Um, and I, I, it's it's really exciting to see. I mean, certainly the sovereign era, the country era, we were all surprised by El Salvador. At least I was. I don't know. Maybe maybe the two of you weren't, as you've had uh, you've had roots in the area for quite a while now. But Simon, uh, playing off of that theme, either with respect to what El Salvador has done, or what you're seeing in the future in terms of sovereigns, is that the Nick? Is that the next major step that you're anticipating? Let's say in the next uh, couple of years. Yeah, I certainly hope so. So, um, you know, what Max was saying, um, there was that eight year period where it was really about the individual front running the company. Um, so it started with a group of very small, a small group of um, activists, cypherpunks, techno geeks, um, and suddenly they became rich over time. Um, and uh, these, these, these people became influential through having monetary power as well and wealth. Um, and so when, you know, we were able to invest in the industry and grow the industry from what was just a, you know, it was, it, it was self-funded. Um, it was people growing wealthy with Bitcoin and then um, chucking them around at each other, um, experimenting with lots of different stuff that led to lots of different scams, lots of alternatives. Um, but, you know, at the end of it, you, you kind of figured out where this industry was going. Um, and then Max mentioned the, the Michael Saylor industry. That was when, you know, really uh, people started to uh, understand that this could be used in a corporate structure and that companies could put a percentage of their balance sheet into Bitcoin. Um, and um, definitely countries is the next era. Um, you know, the, the world that we live in today, um, you know, the, so if you, look, if you look around the world, um, the very first thing before the, you know, the war, um, you know, I don't want to get political on the war side, um, but before it happened, you had both Ukraine and Russia legalizing Bitcoin as a very strategic move. Um, and in the midst of all that chaos, you, Ukraine decided that we needed to legalize Bitcoin. Um, and uh, hundreds of millions were raised, um, uh, you know, in order to support some of the efforts. Um, now, Russia, uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot of talk around um, circumventing sanctions using Bitcoin. If you want to create immutable records of um, circumventing sanctions on a blockchain, then you can. Um, but the reality is, is that um, every central bank around the world now can see that if you do not bow down to the conventional 
um, thinking um, and countries don't necessarily agree with each other on what conventional thinking is, then you can have your reserves sanctioned and confiscated. So China sat on $4.5 trillion of treasuries. Those could be deleted um, or China could say, we're not going to roll over um, the American debt anymore. Um, and so the, the, you know, the Bitcoin strategy uh, for countries and for central banks is really just a no-brainer. Um, it's completely irresponsible financial management not to put a percentage of your sovereign wealth fund um, into Bitcoin, unless, of course, you are one of the dominant currencies that has the most power in the world, which is obviously the dollar at the moment. Um, and so it's like a reverse, um, a reversal where you have the countries that have been shafted the most, like countries in Latin America that have been historically plagued by economic hitmen um, using IMF loans, that now can say, well, we use the dollar, you know, we hyperinflated away our currency. Um, the dollar seems to be a, a, a medium of exchange we can use, but it's being inflated. Um, so let's also make Bitcoin legal tender. No brainer move. Um, and now people can save in Bitcoin and they can spend in dollars. Um, then let's restructure our securities market. Let's create securities laws just for this. Um, structure a bond and we can have a bond that actually, rather than borrowing from and bowing down to Washington DC through an IMF loan or bowing down to uh, Shanghai and Beijing through a China um, Belt and Road loan, um, we can actually construct a bond based upon um, a sovereign currency um, and fixed supply and digital hard sound money. I think that's a no brainer. I think Sri Lanka should be looking at that right now. They're going to take an IMF loan. I think Argentina should be looking at that right now. Um, but I think it takes those small countries showing and paving the way. Um, and then you have it like as a reversal. And the very last one that will purchase Bitcoin um, would be the Fed. Um, and so, you know, you, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a very fascinating <coughs> game theory um, that I see as inevitable, predictable, and guaranteed. Well, that's well said. Um, it, the game theory is uh, it's uh, it's hard to stand against, right? It's uh, it's the dominoes falling. Um, it's something uh, that uh, you've been talking about for uh, quite a few years now as well, Max. Um, maybe if we put a pin in the in the sovereign adoption just for a moment. I know that you launched Elzani Capital along with Swan CEO Corey Clipston. What are you seeing in terms of uh, investment opportunities now with respect to Bitcoin companies or supporting the ecosystem overall? And Simon will want to hear the same uh, from you as well in a minute. But let's start mm. with Max. Yeah, <clears throat> good question. So, well, Simon and I, going back to 2013, we started Bitcoin Capital, one, two, and three, which was really the first VC fund in, in Bitcoin. And uh, at that time, the focus was on exchanges. Uh, you know, my background is, is really with exchanges. Um, Simon had launched a, a platform uh, which, which um, was able to kind of prove uh, a proof of concept, if you will. And so we ended up buying into Kraken at the seed round and Bitso and Bitfinex. And, 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 and the exchange business is really one. There's only two businesses that have come out of this industry, and that's the exchange business and the mining industry. And so the exchanges have done done really well. And so now in 2022 with Elzante Capital, it's uh, really focusing on hyper Bitcoinization. So anything that takes us closer to creating a circular economy like we saw in Elzante, in El Salvador, the people there are living or getting toward living on a Bitcoin standard where they're paid in Bitcoin, they're spending Bitcoin, they're saving in Bitcoin and they're completely divorced from the imf and the world bank and all the colonial interests that come from up north in the us and other countries in the region are quickly figuring out that this is a fantastic thing and so with the fund uh, anything that you know we're looking at startups early stage companies that are going to be pushing the uh, hyper bitcoinization mantra forward uh certainly <clears throat> You know, you, you would definitely need more education. Uh, so anything in ed tech is, you know, education technology uh, would, would definitely be looking at it. But I'm also discovering, you know, on the ground what's happening. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, in El San, we're in El Salvador uh, quite often. And so we're just out there actually, you know, kicking the tires, talking to people and finding out on the ground, you know, what, what people are doing um, and, and just 
finding out where the the momentum and the, and the energy is and um and and going that way one one company that we're already de- um, in, involved with would be uh, jan3 which is samson mo's new company you know he left blockstream and he's starting a company in el salvador it's called jan3 and uh he's all about spreading uh bitcoin uh, sovereign uh, legal tender to different countries and all the infrastructure that goes with that. So um, that's that's already pretty much earmarked to be in the fund. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, lots of exciting opportunity there. Uh, Simon, your thoughts, where are you seeing opportunity as you try to deploy capital into the Bitcoin ecosystem these days? Yeah, so we've now had over a billion dollars uh, bank to the future invested in over a hundred companies um, from 150,000 investors. Um, and obviously the biggest winners. So, you know, with Bitcoin capital, it was actually one of the highest performing uh, venture capital funds out there. It completely outperformed um, any traditional venture capital. In the, um, and a third of it was invested in Bitcoin mining. It paid dividends every single day in Bitcoin. We paid out thousands of Bitcoins um, in dividends. Wow. Um, and uh, it was also investing in companies like uh, Bitstamp, uh, which was uh, which exited Coinbase, which uh, uh, later IPO'd, and uh, Kraken, and Bitfinex, and uh, many other infrastructure and exchange plays. Um, those were the highest performing investments. Um, you do have an era now of um, people wanting to uh, financial services based upon using Bitcoin as collateral. So um, Max mentioned the Michael Saylor industry. Um, or era rather, um, that uh, people don't want to sell their Bitcoin. No one wants to be Bitcoin pizza guy. Uh, We've all been Bitcoin pizza guy. Um, I've given away more Bitcoins than I like to remember um, in my time. And, uh, you know, uh, you soon start to start to learn um, and uh, that uh, borrowing borrowing dollars or borrowing stable coins rather than selling your Bitcoin, um, if managed directly is the more sensible strategy um, if you, you know, you can manage it as your wealth grows. Um, and also um, receiving yield is um, just, uh, you know, the, the the financial markets were built upon debt. I do want to make a distinction here because um, we are moving from, you know, a fiat desk, debt-based money to, I believe, my forecast is, uh, is that we move into a non-debt-based central bank digital currency era. Uh, so I believe that all fiat currencies are moving to central bank digital currencies in the future. Um, which to me is communism on a blockchain. Um, but uh, the, the, um, in, in order to combat that, um, we need many financial services built upon digital hard sound money. Now, the difference uh, with Bitcoin financial services is rather than borrowing based upon your credit rating, um, you have to first generate wealth. So you stack your sats, um, you generate wealth over time, and it encourages savings because every time you spend it, you get punished. Um, And then once you do that, you want to take a percentage of it, maybe put it at risk, receive a bit of yield. um, But you also want to borrow, you know, might want to borrow against it um, and, uh, you know, and play a kind of um, a a speculative attack, as it were, where um, on fiat currency and central bank digital currencies. Um, So these are the types of companies. There's lots of different financial services that were being built around that. Um, You can do really interesting, um, you know, plays around now when, um, debt capital markets are being built around Bitcoin bonds. Um, you could borrow at a certain yield, and then you could invest at another yield and get a ca- um, you know a carry in between. Um, so the markets are just getting really, really sophisticated um, as more and more institutions enter the market, um, and as more and more banks enter. So the key difference here is that it's all being built upon a wealth effect, whereas the the traditional financial system encourages debt because money goes down in value and therefore you're encouraged to take on loans and you're encouraged to spend as fast as possible. In Bitcoin, it does the opposite. You're encouraged to save, um, you're rewarded for saving, and then you want to unlock um, and use that collateral in order to build um, and be more speculative, but based upon savings rather than debt. Um, So it's like an anti-debt effect um, and one of the largest wealth distributions that I think um, you could imagine from those that decide to get on Bitcoin versus those that decide to wait until the central bank digital currency um, creates communism on a blockchain. Well, Simon, I love that you're funding uh, Bitcoin collateralized credit debt because 
that for me is one of the biggest uh, focuses. Personally, I never want to sell any Bitcoin. I only want to borrow against it. I have to say, I haven't done so yet. And the reason I haven't done so yet is I'm unwilling personally to do it without a significant term so that I don't get rug pulled, right? So I don't get liquidated. So that's one of the things that uh, that I'm waiting for personally in the space. I got to meet Adam Reeds over at Ledin uh, at the conference. Um, interested to see what they're uh, what they're building there in the same vein. But I'm curious. Um, I'll kick this to you, Max. How have you thought about borrowing against Bitcoin? You know, with respect to let's say the options out there. Um, I still feel like there's pretty far to go, so I'm glad that you both are are funding these types of operations that are going to deliver uh, term debt, hopefully against Bitcoin collateral. But uh, what what are your thoughts about it? Well, once again, you know, Michael Saylor is kind of leading the way, right? He just did a deal with um, um, what's the name of the bank? Um, Silvergate. Silvergate. Silvergate yep. And uh, so he put up some Bitcoin and borrowed 200 million to buy more Bitcoin. And um, I, I I was talking to some folks at the conference. I believe he paid five five and a quarter percent mm-hmm. for that, which is a leaden is a service. Uh, I think that they are. Uh, it's a seven point nine percent is um, the interest that they're charging folks to 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 uh, borrow against their Bitcoin. I, I talked to Adam as well at the conference, and uh, I, I looked into lead, and it looks. It looks pretty good, um, but as you say, as you say, um, you know, you can get rug pulled on the volatility without having a, a longer term um, instrument. So um, that would that would be helpful. But um, clearly, you know, it's uh, not. It, it have this pristine asset. So if you can borrow against it, then you don't get the tax liability. And and for a lot of us, you know, our cost basis you know, is in the single digits. So <laughs> clearly, you know, out of, if you're selling it and you had 40,000, that's uh, quite a, quite a tax hit. Um, so uh, that, that's welcome. Very welcome. Um, and um, so, yeah, these platforms are coming around. I, I would imagine that the, the institutions and the banks that make their money making loans principally are going to get more involved uh, in this core business that they're in. They're in this core business as more banks uh, become custodians. And that's a fairly recent development, right? Uh, Mellon Bank in New York is now a custodian for Bitcoin and banks have become official custodians of their Bitcoin. So the, all the, the infrastructure of the banking is coming to Bitcoin. It allows for them to offer <clears throat> traditional types of products and there will be competition uh, amongst these banks. And, and so, you know, interest, uh could could come down uh should come down and uh the power is shifting from the fiat money world to the bitcoin world and the bitcoiners are starting to have a lot of political clout in washington Uh, they're having political clout in different countries around the world um they're having clout within corporations that are you know pushing for greater bitcoin exposure on the balance sheet so bitcoin is becoming as we've often said it's becoming it's such a perfect asset and such a such perfect money and it's so in, indisputably perfect that its path toward um this type of domination of the financial world was inevitable as everybody says and uh, and and so now we're seeing that play out well said and uh and so, speaking of uh, you mentioned bank in new york mellon custodying bitcoin it was as recently, I think, as 2018 that I was at a conference and the major major regular asset, you know, legacy asset custodians were all there. And I asked the bony guy, I asked the Bank of New York guy, when are you guys going to get a uh, custody Bitcoin? And he literally laughed in my face. Uh, that was uh, that was four years ago. Uh, what a way uh, we've come since then. Simon, you foresaw the reshaping of the financial system, the banking system at least a decade and a half ago what you know what are your current thoughts with respect to how it's gone how bitcoin's being integrated at the moment any surprises for you in terms of how uh, how it's shaped up essentially the path that's gotten us from uh from the the uh the busted structure that you saw many years ago to uh, where we are today 
Yeah, so, um, you know, when when I um, first got involved in Bitcoin, went to that conference, I was pretty beaten up. Um, I was, you know, um, I was my, my focus at the time before the Bitcoin community, I was part of something called the monetary reform community. Um, and in the monetary reform community, we had to go around to politicians, we had to go around to bankers. Um, I spoke at like House of Commons, House of Parliament, House of Lords, all these different places. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to persuade them that the existing system that they were really benefiting from um, should change. Um, and it was really the only way I knew how to do something was, um, you know, top down. Um, but when Bitcoin came along, it created this bottom up movement and suddenly life got very exciting. Um, you know, just seeing that uh, entrepreneurs could create financial services on top of a, a permissionless financial um, product um, or currency or whatever you want to call it. It was different things to different people. Um, it was a really exciting time. I do get nostalgia from the old days because it was when it was just Bitcoin versus the banks um, and it was a fun fight. Um, but now as our industry, you know, has grown and grown and grown, um, I was surprised by the ginormous impact. It became clearer and clearer over time. And I was, you know, Max and uh, myself have been preaching all over that whole time. But I think when it actually happens, it's still surprising, even if you're expecting it to happen. Um, and I still get amazed and I'm still grateful for Bitcoin. Um, and I still look at, you know, how far our industry has become. And the fact that it is now involved, you know, the fact that every single person in the world that I've ever, that I speak to today has at least heard of Bitcoin, they may think it's a Ponzi scheme or a scam or a currency just for drug dealers or a get rich quick scheme, but more and more people know that it's not. And that's what's creating that asymmetric bet um, that people are playing um, against. So when you look at it today, um, to think that Bitcoin would lead to this, um, you know, this this whole thing, um, there was a there was an attack on Bitcoin around about 2014, where everyone tried to drop the name Bitcoin and the banks tried to use the word blockchain. And they were telling, if, you know, it became trendy to talk about blockchain and not talk about Bitcoin. Um, and they tried to, you know, um, almost take over the technology. And, the, and uh, there was a time when I was a little bit concerned that maybe the only thing that comes out of this is we find a way of banks committing fraud cheaper um, on a blockchain. But then it becomes apparent over time um, that that's just not really the case. Um, so the end result is that um, as all fiat currencies move towards central bank digital currencies, it attacks the banking system. People often talk about Bitcoin as, um, you know, central bank digital currencies as an attack on Bitcoin um, and a reason not to invest in Bitcoin because governments are going to come along and create central bank digital currencies. Um, central bank digital currencies are actually an attack on banking. Um, banks are screwed by central bank digital currencies. Um, if central banks start issuing digital currency, that's very disruptive towards the bank's business model. Um, so, you know, the, the fact that now everything is moving towards technology built upon centralized institutions, and now we have an exit from the traditional financial system in Bitcoin, um, and you have these centralized companies that are going to build Bitcoin banking. And then you have uh, decentralized services that be built on top of the protocol and upgrades to Bitcoin are happening slowly over time that make that possible. Um, it really is um, really, really exciting time. And, you know, I paraphrase every single video I create on YouTube, I end with today is one of the most interesting and exciting time to be alive in financial history. And that is thanks to Bitcoin. And I will always be grateful to Bitcoin. I think it's a force for good, a force for peace. Um, and uh, I think it's really, really important in many of these countries that are experiencing the different reasons. And I, I'm amazed that we've got this far, even though I was forecasting we get this far. When it happens, it's still surprising. Yeah, well said, Simon. I think we all in our Bitcoin journey, as we do our research and think about scenario analyses, we think about, yeah, what happens if, if government launches a competitor? Um, I certainly remember at one point I had some doubt about, oh, what if FedCoin shows up? Will that be competition for Bitcoin? And I reached the same conclusion you did, which was number one, yeah, that would gut the banking system. So that's going to that's gonna hold them off for a few years. And then number two, even if they do it, it's not a substitute for Bitcoin because there's no substitute for the monetary policy of Bitcoin. Um, unless and until the governments uh, actually show some fiscal rectitude, not too worried about uh, CBDCs competing, uh, competing with Bitcoin. Well, speaking of uh, such fiscal rec rectitude and uh, what's going on with respect to the legacy system and the, and the IMF and uh, basically those Bretton Woods 
organizations that we've uh, come to know and love uh, and hate, uh, you know, since the 1940s. Um, what do you foresee uh, with respect to actions they're taking, you know, their comments about what's going on with El Salvador? You know, what what's next, do you think, for those legacy Bretton Woods organizations? I'll send this to, to you, Max. Yeah, um, absolutely. So let me just comment briefly on <clears throat> something that was, you know, just talking about because it plays into this idea of toxic Bitcoin maximalism. And where does that come from? You know, it comes from the fact that if you've been in doing this for almost 12 years, you know, you're starting from a position where literally 100% of the people on planet Earth were against this idea or hated this idea or refused to accept this idea. And it, it was, it's been a struggle to get people to look at this idea for 12 years. So Bitcoin is very, very different in that respect, because if you come up with something like, you know, a better mousetrap, right? The world will be the path to your door. You know, innovation creates demand and creates um, all kinds of momentum economically. And uh, we've seen this in many industries, you know. Um, but with Bitcoin, because you bring innovation to money, actually the first response anyone has is to throw up. <laughs> because you, you're you taking something that they hold dear to their psyche and their consciousness, and you're saying that's wrong. Everything you've thought about money is actually wrong. And nobody wants to accept that. Nobody wants to deal with that. So very from the very beginning, um, when you keep telling people you're wrong, uh, the response is, well, you're toxic. You're you're toxic. You're a maximalist. You know, that that's what people respond because they're being told that they're wrong, <laughs> you know, over and over again. Uh, and so it's hard to be on the side of a Bitcoin, you know, believer because you're you're getting, you're, you're having to, it's like being an exorcist. You know, you show up in the middle of the night and Linda Blair is on the bed trapped in a fiat money devil. And, and you're trying to get her to, you know, come to Jesus, come to Satoshi and they're projectile vomiting everywhere. <clears throat> you know, it's a messy business. Um, so I just want, I just wanted to say that um, as far as El Salvador goes, you know, we were, I was, I had Tour de Meester on my show in 2014, and we were trying to spitball who would be the first country to adopt Bitcoin. Uh, we mentioned a few names. We didn't mention El Salvador, but we thought it'd be a smaller country, an agile country, a country that needed uh, its own money that was being abused by the dollar system. Uh, I also had Trace Mayer on, if anyone remembers Trace Mayer. Uh, we talked uh, several times about Bitcoin on the sovereign level. So there was, uh, we've just been waiting for the country to come along and say, hey, we're going to make Bitcoin legal tender. And uh, El, 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 El Salvador was that country, I, uh, primarily from the work of Jack Mahler's and the strike lightning wallet, you know, and El Zante, it gravitated up to the president's office and the rest is history. And um, it's... Um, it's the IMF clearly is not doesn't like this. And uh, we just had a story this past week uh, where Bitcoiners are were in the New York Post. They had a story that, well, Bitcoiners are basically psychopaths and the Bitcoin is basically evil. I, again, I return to my to, this is the whole history, you know, as, as the exorcism that we we that that we've lived for 12 years having to deal with this uh, denial by the vast majority of the population who do not want to reconsider or consider that everything they have believed about money is false. Uh, and yet that's, the, that's where we're at. Everything everyone believes about money is false. Even the gold bugs, you know, gold bugs who you would think would be more sympathetic to Bitcoin. They, most of them are also hate Bitcoin because it challenges everything they believe about gold so to be you know you end up being if you're a bitcoin maximalist you know you're a hated figure because nobody wants to face the fact that they've been dead wrong their whole lives about something very basic like money you know the uh the humans are are, are basically just food and sex you know the primary drivers and 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 behind that is money and so when you destroy that model um, you know, no one's going to 
pat you on the back and say, thank you for crushing my worldview. Thank you for destroying the paradigms of, on, on, upon which I've based my entire existence. No, they're going to hate you for that. But it doesn't change the fact that Bitcoin's on this unstoppable path, unstoppable vector. And the, the, what we say is, you know, you don't change Bitcoin. Bitcoin changes you. Just, you know, let it let it happen. You know, you've you've been wrong your whole life, but it doesn't mean that you can't start to be right about what's happening. Well said. Well, you've been taking arrows uh, from all directions, Max, uh, for well over a decade. Likewise, uh, likewise, Simon, uh, playing off of what Max said, is it the same? Do you see the same rejection uh, psychologically? Do you see the same struggle that people have getting their head around this thing? And then also, you know, if you were the guy or one of the very few guys who a decade and a half ago was saying, this is going to go in a very different direction, right? The system, you know, is wrong and it's going to change drastically. Um, how, how have the slings and arrows been for you? And uh, has it ever gotten easier? Um, yeah, well, B Bitcoin makes it really easy because um, if you have a longer term time frame, you, you just like, I've never been more consistently proven right than with Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin punishes the short term thinker and, and rewards the long term. Um, I'm eternally grateful for Bitcoin because it changed my life financially forever. Um, I, I never imagined um, that it could possibly, um, you know, have such a such such a big impact on me, many of the companies that I created um, and many of the countries that I've tried to support over the years in adjusting to this new um, this this new paradigm. So I don't really concern my myself too much because I have um, such conviction in the fact that um, most people come to the conclusion on their own. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, for example, in 2014, um, we launched the first Bitcoin bond. We could only find 17 investors to invest in the, in the Bitcoin bond. It turned out to be one of the highest performing investments in history. Um, and uh, those that invested in it, um, you know, uh, thank thank us forever. Um, and those that didn't invest in it um, come back to me and say, Jesus, why didn't I listen? Um, so, you know, it's got this self-correcting um, mechanism where, you know, you don't get too many people that are, that, that are just going to wait right until the very end, like the Peter Schiff's of the world. Um, and because he, he's gone too far in telling his investors not to buy it. Um, but you know, in, in terms of like the IMF and st and 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 stuff like that, um, you know, countries have choices right now, and the choice is that you can either, um, you know, if you were an IMF and you're issuing a loan, um, you have a, a a choice, and that is that you can take your money, you lend your money, um, you created it out of thin air because IMF is actually money creation on a global scale as well through special drawing rights, which are overdraft facilities rather than it's a bit, it's a very misleading term um, because although there is a fund um, that pulled their gold together in order to be a member, they also were involved in money creation through special drawing rights. And um, World Bank also is involved in money creation because they issue bonds that are purchased by banks and banks create digital currency every time they issue a loan. So a bank creates some money in order to purchase the bond so these are completely illegitimate loans but they all come i released a video called um, bitcoin has no terms and conditions um and so when when you borrow money from the imf it is going to come with terms and conditions because if you were lending your money and it was a highly risky proposition um then you would want to direct politics you'd want to have um, influence over the direction of the company um you take the money and you make sure that it's spent back in your country um, and then you saddle the country with debt. The dollars end up back in America, um, you know, with corp through corporate interest. Um, and then when the loan is defaulted upon, you privatize the, the very resources that are keeping those countries. And, you know, if you look at IMF loans, they've been paid off many times over in the interest that they paid. And they're still deeper in debt, almost five times over, um, even though they have repaid those loans in the interest repayments many times over. Um, and so it hasn't worked well for it, for, for, for very many. Um, same with the infrastructure loans that come from, um, you know, China Empire building um, at the moment. And, uh, you know, Sri Lanka is a, a classic example. Um, you look at Sri Lanka, it's, it's ladled with IMF debt. It's defaulting on um, many of its sovereign, uh, of its sovereign debt. It's taken loans from China. 
Um, and yet, it could, off, um, you know, look at what El Salvador's doing. It could, off, it could issue a bond for a very specific project um, based upon um, Bitcoin, so that you don't necessarily have to concern yourself um, too much with just the project. There's also the the Bitcoin play, and it has no terms and conditions. So staying sovereign um, is, is really the key to when I look at a lot of the political conflict. You know. Um, a lot of this political conflict is caused, if you look back at Ukraine, um, from it was one of the largest debtors to IMF. That comes with terms and conditions. Those terms and conditions are we need to build military bases, which then gets you into NATO politics. You build it on Russia's border, um, you know, and then you have a, a you have these types of politics that can happen. Um, and it is because it is these international loans that can have a significant path and difference for your country. Um, and so by having Bitcoin as a mechanism whereby countries um, can make it legal tender for their individuals, provide services to convert it to local currency, gold, Bitcoin, um, dollars, um, and then also issue bonds upon it. Um, that, that's a really exciting proposition. So our industry is just getting started. If you're involved in it right now, you are still an early adopter. Well, I couldn't have said it any better myself. Those economic hitmen are very deadly, but uh, thankfully we've got Bitcoin. Thankfully we are so early. And despite the fact that these two gentlemen have been at it for well over a decade, uh, they still see huge, huge upside uh, into the future. Well, we're going to uh, cut it over to Twitter spaces in just a moment. I do want to give you both, you gentlemen, a chance to uh, make any final comments you may have at the moment. And then we're going to head over, take some Q&A from the audience. But uh, Simon, any, uh, any words for the moment before we head to the spaces? Um, no, just saying that, you know, um, education is a really important um, factor in this. Um, so thank you for inviting me on this channel. Um, you know, Max was the first to cover it on television. Um, that made a really big difference to our industry. So um, really grateful for that. Um, and to entrepreneurs like you and Swan, you know, for creating services that make these things more easy. Um, and uh, I'll continue every single month. I made a commitment 11 years ago, and I still have the same commitment today. Um, that each and every month I want to have more Bitcoin than I had the previous month. Um, a few just, you know, a few tips in terms of how people think. Um, your job is to stop being a fiat thinker and try and become a Bitcoin thinker. If you're a fiat thinker, when Bitcoin price goes down, you worry because you tend to think of it in terms of what goods it buys you. Does it pay your rent? Does it pay your mortgage? Um, if you become a Bitcoin thinker, you really look forward to these price corrections because it allows you to use your fiat as a mechanism for buying more Bitcoin. When the price goes up, you feel a bit more wealthy. So one quick tip I give is separate your spending money from your Bitcoin. Um, don't think of Bitcoin as your spending money until you become wealthy and you choose to put some over to your spending money. Um, and this can really psychologically um, help with um, really getting excited about downward markets. And that really has been the key. The richest people that I know in this industry, they bought a load of Bitcoin, they held it for long enough, they invested in a bunch of companies, um, and uh, they had a long term a long term time preference and ignored all the all the price corrections in between. Um, so if Swan's creating financial you know applications and services that make that easier, um, then then really excited about <laughs> this case. Great advice, Simon. Thank you for that. Any uh, any words closing here, Max? Before space? um yeah, I would you know speaking about education, Simon's got some really great videos on his channel. Uh, you know when he talks about how CBDCs are actually an attack on the banks, that's something I first heard from him really talking about it. And he's got a couple of videos talking, getting into detail on, about that that are very very illuminating. And um, so I recommend you know his videos are very good because you get the whole big banking picture and how it relates to Bitcoin and then you can start to see where the potential is here because Bitcoin as we were saying earlier has the potential to eat value around the world so um, we're talking about hundreds of trillions of dollars of value and that, that translates into millions of dollars per coin in price so that's a huge upside still remains. Amen. Well, thank you, Max. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I personally, and I know the whole audience has learned a ton from both of you over the years, and uh, I expect we will continue to. We're going to give the audience a chance to ask you some questions. So we're going to cut over to, uh, to spaces here right now. 
I'll say a couple words and then uh, we'll be joining that room here uh, momentarily. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining that great conversation. These two OGs uh, continue to share vast amounts of knowledge. I get smarter every time I listen to them. Uh, we're going to ask them some questions, give you an opportunity to ask them some questions, I should say. And uh, just a reminder, Swan Bitcoin is one of the easiest and cheapest ways to buy Bitcoin. No matter if you're a financial advisor or a client or a high net worth individual or a business or just a regular pleb, uh, check out swan.com, get started sacking sats today and own your future like these two gentlemen here. Thanks and we'll see you over on Twitter.